Hello everyone. So I'm making this particular video today at the request of a friend of mine. Um, she owns a, I guess I should say sort of a pagan occult witchcraft store. Uh, and of course they sell some books. And I was in there yesterday uh, before my state had our full-on social distancing lockdown and all non-essential retail uh, shut down. And I was talking with her and there's one particular book that she had on the shelf and she asked my opinion on it. Whether I thought it was a good book, not a good book. Uh, so I took a quick look at it um, and had an opinion. And she had asked after that if I would be willing or interested in making just a quick video to talk a little about good resources versus bad resources when it comes to this subject of fairies and sort of what people should look for, um, particularly with books. So you can't see from where I'm sitting at the moment, but you've probably noticed in other videos I've done that I have quite a lot of books, very interested in books. Um, and I do think it's important that people have sort of a way to discern, even if they're not super familiar with specific material, whether a book is worth the money, um, whether it's going to be quality or not, sort of from the get-go. So what I thought I would do is give you two examples. One is the book from my friend's store yesterday, which she volunteered to give me so that I could do this little book review here. And the other is a book uh, by Llewellyn. It's a mainstream um, pagan publishing company. Uh, it's a newer book that just came out. Um, full disclosure, as you'll notice on the cover, I did write the foreword for it. I'm going to admit that up front. But I chose this one as my second example because it is by a mainstream publishing company, you know, by Pagan Standards, uh, which a lot of people sometimes can look down on a bit, but it is a very good book. Uh, the reason I ended up writing the foreword for it is because when I was given the advanced copy of the text, I was so impressed with it. Um, I really, really liked it. So I'm going to talk a little about things you can um, sort of look at quickly so that you would know that this is a good book before having read it and then versus things that you would look at sort of quickly with this one um, to sort of tell immediately that it's probably not the best resource to use. So, and I will say that in, in both these cases the titles really don't tell you very much. So we have John Cruz's The um, Fairy, A Guide to Lore, Magic, and the World of the Good Folk, which is a good book. And then we have uh, Teresa Mori, The Fairy Bible. So, start off first with the problematic-ish book. And um, as with all books, obviously, there is value to be found in it. It's not completely useless. Uh, it's just not really the best source to be going to. Uh, and it does include misinformation that can be confusing or misleading to people who are not super familiar um, with this subject. So the very first thing I always say when you're picking up any book is to look at the bibliography. The bibliography of a book can tell you quite a lot. It can tell you what sources that text is looking at. It can tell you um, how many, how diverse the sources are that the book is looking at. And it will kind of give you a, a hint of the, the author's perspective, um, the direction the book is probably going to be going in. And you can look at, uh, for example, the ages of the sources. Um, anything with folklore or fairies, you are going to have a lot of older sources because a lot of folklore material is a little bit older, some of it. But there should be a good 
diversity and array. When we look at the fairy Bible, the first thing I did yesterday when my friend asked me was to flip to the back. It does have really nice illustrations, I will say. It is to flip to the back and the bibliography. That is the bibliography right here on this page. So for this entire book, which is 392 pages, it lists exactly six sources. That's a problem. <laughs> That's a problem. Specifically for anything like this that is um, sort of put out there supposedly to be very thorough or include a lot of material. Now having um, read through it last night and this morning, it, it clearly is pulling on more than just these six sources, but it never cites any references. Um, it never says specifically where the author was getting any particular information. Um, so while I'm familiar with the six things that are listed in the bibliography, um, I know that there's some other things that were being pulled on in various places in here. Um, but I would have to just try to guess where that information is coming from, because we don't know. Another thing, when we're looking at the bibliography of this particular book, um, it does have uh, a really solid one in here, which is uh, Catherine Briggs' Dictionary of Fairies. It will always be my main go-to book recommendation on the subject of fairies. Um, it has two kind of newer, uh, more new age sort of books, um, newer as in 21st century. Uh, Ted Andrews' Enchantment of the Fairy Realm and um, Ellen Guiley's uh, Fairy Magic. Those are not bad books. Um, Ted Andrews definitely has a very particular viewpoint on fairies, which is much more in the elemental realm from what I remember. And, um, sorry, Rosemary Ellen. I lost her first name there. Um, is definitely coming from a very neo-pagan, sort of pagan viewpoint. Um, and you do have to consider things like that when you're looking at books and at, at sources for things. You know, what are the author's biases? What was their approach? Catherine Briggs was an academic. Um, her material was written um, in that tone and for that audience. Um, there's a couple other things that are really problematic out of these six sources that are listed here. Um, one of them is Brian Froud's Fairy Oracle. I mean, the Oracle deck does come with a book, but it's not meant to teach folklore. Um, I have the Fairy Oracle. I actually really love the Fairy Oracle, and I'm a huge Brian Froud fan. But that particular oracle and the book that comes with it, its intention is not to teach or convey folklore or information. It's, it's very specific to the cards that he made for the oracle. And um, a lot of it is sort of what we might call channeled information. So that gets a bit of a side eye from me that that's one of the six resources for, for this entire thing. Um, the other thing is that it includes John Matthews' Secret Lives of Elves and Fairies, which is a work of fiction. Um, and that's a big red flag that that's being used as a source here. Um, it was, that book was initially put out, sort of uh, marketed as nonfiction. Um, it's supposedly Reverend Kirk's personal journals. Um, but it's, it's not actually. It's, it's John Matthews wrote it. Um, he used some material from uh, Reverend Kirk's actual work, some common folklore, uh, Stolen Bride, the Barred Midwife, those kind of stories. Um, and then he fictionalized and, and wrote the bulk of the book, basically. Um, and some of it, it repeats material from one of his other books called The She... Um, which was channeled material to him. So not that there's anything necessarily directly wrong with channeled material. Um, it's just important to note that this, which is being put out as sort of a um, definitive guide 
two fairies um, is relying at least partially on fiction, um, directly on fiction. And I'm not honestly sure if that's because the author was not aware that that book was fiction uh, or, or why that is particularly listed. But when you're looking at books and sources and you look at a bibliography for a book that's it's a fairly chunky book and it only has six um, other books that it's mentioning and one of those is a card oracle deck and one of them is fiction, that's never going to be a good sign. Um, that's never going to go well. It would be different if this was the sort of book where it was more one person's... Um, spiritual journey, uh, if it was, you know, being put out there as this was this one person's beliefs and opinions, that's a separate kind of thing. And we would judge the, the references for that, the bibliography for that differently. But when something's being put out in a more, um, I mean, it calls itself a Bible, but it's more of a dictionary encyclopedia sort of format. Um, and it's drawing on very limited sources, and those are the sources it's using, that's not gonna, gonna go well. Um, when you pick up the book, after you look at the bibliography, one of the next things that I'll do is just sort of quickly skim through and see if anything jumps out at me. Uh, I might read select portions, um, popular topics, things that I'm really familiar with. Uh, for people who don't know very much about fairies, I realize this could be a little more complicated. Um, I will say that it was pretty immediately clear that this book was not going to be a good resource because under the category of air fairies, it lists Odin. Um, the Germanic Norse god Odin is not a fairy, by the way, by any stretch of the definition of the word fairy. Um, it also mentions in the text that his wife Frigga, according to this, is a fairy, which is not. It's, it's ex very contradicted in pretty much all Norse and Germanic mythology. Uh, and then a few pages later we have Hermes. Um, I don't know a lot, to be fair, about Greek and um, in Roman myth would be Mercury. Uh, about Greek and Roman mythology, but I do know that the Greek and Roman gods are not fairies. That's just such a strange, strange thing, strange direction to go in right here. Um, so just from quickly skimming it and seeing those two things, and then on top of the, the very scanty and sort of questionable bibliography, that would be a red flag for, for anyone sort of trying to find a decent book out there. Uh, and there's more. I mean, I could go on. I don't want to just spend this whole video criticizing this one particular book. Um, and again, not to say that there, there might not potentially be some valuable or uh, decent things in here. Uh, it does include a brief little dictionary of fairies at the very end, um, things are miscategorized, uh, there's a general category and then there's Australian, Belgian, Celtic slash Irish. I don't know why the author seems to think that the only Celts were Irish, but not an uncommon thought I guess. Central European, Chinese, English, French, German, and so on through a variety of different cultures. Um, it kind of ends with uh, Scandinavian, Scottish, Spanish, Turkish, and Welsh. Scottish and Welsh would also be Celtic language speaking, hence my puzzlement a moment ago. Um, but either way, some of what's put in the general category should be in other categories. Um, you know, just for one random example, the author lists the Seely Court under the general category um, and kind of describes them as helpful and, and good fairies. And then uh, the Unseely Court is actually under the Scottish category, uh, malevolent. And then it, you know, it mentions red caps as being unseely, even though red caps are more English folklore. I'm not actually disputing that they might be categorized as unseely, just that it's strange 
under the Scottish category um, to mention those when there's plenty of Scottish examples of unseelie fairies. So the whole thing is just very haphazard and um, a little oddly done. So this is definitely one that would not not be a super good resource. It does have really nice pictures um, and it I, I can say that I admire its attempt to cover um, every possible topic even if I don't think the the execution um, was uh, ideal. Um, you know another quick example under fairy festivals it just lists the neo-pagan uh, Wheel of the Year, the eight neo-pagan holidays, and there's really no specifically fairy folklore for that. Um, and some of the neo-pagan holidays, there there really isn't much fairy lore or fairy connection to those specific dates. Um, so it just seems strange to have taken that in particular and sort of fused it into this, in my opinion. Getting to the example of Better Book, Fairy by John Cruz. Like I said, the first thing I would do is flip back to the bibliography. Uh, the bibliography in the case for this book is about 10 pages long. So we're looking at uh, roughly 200 different sources that were referenced and cited. Um, and it's a 276 page book. So about 200 um, sources for this. You don't necessarily have to have that many for it to be a decent book, but that's always going to be a good sign. And, you know, flipping through, you'll see that it's, it's a wide array, a wide variety of different sources, um, different dates, uh, Predictably, there are quite a few 19th century just because of the topic. Uh, that does not surprise me. But there's also a good number of um, 20th century um, and then even a few 21st century sources that are being looked at. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, any book that has a nice solid bibliography, um, particularly one that's pretty much just on topic for the book. You know, these are all pretty much folklore, fairy lore folk tales, um, occasionally some culturally specific things. Those are all good signs. Those are all going to be good indications that this is a, a more quality text to be going with. Um, this one, instead of a little dictionary of fairies at the end, has a glossary of terms. And for the most part, um, they're, they're pretty spot on. Um, spelling is good, definitions are pretty good, uh, so that's all also, a, you know, what you would want to look for, um, if you're quickly glancing through a book. You know, the next thing, as I said, I would do is kind of just skim through, um, and, you know, sort of look at whatever sections pop up, maybe read a little bit, um, this book is just a really solid book. Uh, the way it's set up, uh, it's divided into pretty easy to understand sections. Uh, start it with an introduction, then history and traditions, uh, discussing different ways to categorize fairies, identifying fairies, um, and then all sorts of different, uh, basically everything you would want to know um, the author tends to focus mostly on British fairy lore, um, more so than other areas, uh, which is good. But, you know, flipping through, you could pick any particular section and read a little about it. You'll see that the pages have footnotes. Uh, also, always, well, I shouldn't say always, but that's usually a pretty good sign. Um, the citations are clear which is definitely a good sign. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's clear that a lot of effort and research went into this book. And if you're going for a book who is billing itself or is marketing 
as sort of a definitive guide um, that's meant to be more objective material, uh, not necessarily sort of academic, but um, from that more objective, less personal opinion, then these are the sorts of things you would want to see. Um, end notes or footnotes, uh, really solid bibliography, um, really clear um, either chapters or divisions within the text for the different subjects. Uh, you you kind of want to see all of that. In the other book, we don't see that. There's, there's no real referencing, there's no citations, very skimpy, kind of anemically sad bibliography. Um, and then the way things are organized is a little chaotic. And the things that are included. I mean, because this is a, a good book, I can't kind of make that direct comparison. Um, pretty much everything that's included in here makes sense and uh, is either arguable or be, can be supported with the folklore, which is what the author does. Um, and that's a big difference between books that have these citations that rely on sources and books that don't. The other book, everything is just presented as fact, and the reader is sort of left to take that all as if it is agreed upon factual information when quite a bit of it is not. Whereas this makes it clear where specific things are coming from um, and the author is pretty good when it is his opinion um, or when he's sort of expressing his own theories and ideas of making that clear. So, you know, of the two, this is definitely the, the much better choice to go with. Um, and this it's probably one of my main recommendations for people who are interested in the subject and want something that's um, not academic per se, but very much in that tone and very good accurate information, uh, this would be what to look for. Things like this. Solid bibliography, um, clear chapters and divisions, clear citations as much as possible, um, footnotes and endnotes are a wonderful thing. All of those are, are positive. That does not mean that you cannot have a book that has all of that, that still has really questionable information or outdated theories or problems, but in a general sense, um, these are all good things that you would want to look for with a book. When you have books that are putting forth things as facts and they're not giving you that basis to work with, uh, that's, that's just always going to be really difficult, particularly when they're saying things that are not widely agreed upon um, or even are, you know, pretty much you're never going to hear anyone except this particular book making that statement. Uh, for example, the whole Odin and Frigga are fairies. I can honestly say I've never heard that anywhere else before. Um, so... I hope that kind of gives everyone an idea. Uh, I realize these are sort of super popular books. There's, they have these for like all sorts of different subjects. The pictures are awesome. It can be sort of appealing because of the way it's laid out, because it seems like it's very thorough and in depth. Um, just important to keep in mind with things like this that sometimes you can have quite a lot of content that has absolutely no depth or veracity to it. So, I'll leave you with that thought. Um, if you all have any questions, any additional commentary you would like to add, your opinions on books, uh, but this is for my friend. Don't get this book again <laughs> in your store. Uh, I realize some people will like this book anyway, and that's obviously perfectly fine to each their own. Uh, just be aware that while some of the content in here um, is, you know, pretty stable, a lot of it is less so, and some of it is um, outright contradictory to or foreign to existing folklore. We'll just say that. So, you know, if, if I had a choice, I would definitely go with John Cruz's book. That's what I would recommend. Um, 
whether you like this book or don't like this book, or get this book or don't get this book, still things to keep in mind when evaluating a source. Um, skimpy bibliography, no citations, no footnotes, no references, but lots of things put forward as, as factual information. That's kind of a red flag. You at least want to make sure you're using a lot more discernment and maybe a gigantic grain of salt with things like this. So, that's my thought for today. My apologies to the author of the Fairy Bible. It's nothing personal. I do not know you personally. Um, just my thoughts on the book. So, everyone have a nice day, and I will see you all around eventually.